much for that very kind introduction, um, and thanks all of you for coming. And I should apologize in advance about my voice. Uh, sorry for my cold. Uh, I'll try and get through all of this. Um, so I'm going to talk about data management in the Chinese text project, which is a project which I've been running for about 12 years, I think, now, since it's been online anyway. Um, and this is basically a digital library of pre-modern Chinese textual material. Um, so primarily transmitted texts from throughout Chinese history up until the uh, early Republican period. And it's an online project. Uh, it has a web address here, ctext.org. Uh, so I'm going to start by introducing a bit about some of the most important types of data in the system. And then I'm going to make some comments about preparation and curation of data. So where our, act our actual data comes from and how it's maintained. And this is going to primarily involve um, a quick discussion, because we don't have a lot of time, of optical character recognition for these types of materials and how we get better results with this, and crowdsourcing, because this is really very important to the way this database is maintained at the moment, and this actually has a lot of consequences for how we run various aspects of the project and maintain the data. And lastly, another important thing I want to cover is dissemination and sharing of the data, particularly how we use an application programming interface to export this data in real time uh, to allow for integration with other projects and to allow use of the data in text mining, uh, research, and teaching. So there is a lot of data in this project and in the system, but the most fundamentally important types are images of historical editions of historical texts, so sequences of page images, like this one, which is a page image from a book in the Harvard Yenjing Library. Uh, we have the whole of the Harvard Yenjing Rare Books collection is included in this project, along with uh, material contributed by other libraries. Uh, the second type of important uh, fundamental kind of data that we have are transcriptions of this type of material. So in most cases, like in this example, these two representations are linked together within this uh, system so that, for example, you can have full text search using the transcription or, or you can work with the transcription as your primary way of interacting with the text, but you can also refer back to the um, authoritative scanned image data to confirm exactly how this looked in this particular edition. Uh, and within the ctext interface, this looks something like this. Uh, you can interact with things in the full text view, uh, but you can also click a button and immediately view the same material in the side-by-side -side image and transcription view here uh, with the search terms highlighted and so on. Uh, it's important to emphasize at the start that these two things are really just different visualizations of the same underlying data. So this image and transcription view, which is very closely tied to the original uh, page images, is just one representation of the underlying data that's also used for the uh, textual representation of the data. So these two things are linked uh, internally using a uh, XML representation, which I'll come back to and give an example of a bit later on. But these are not two different copies of the text. These are the same copy of the text visualized in two different ways. Uh, we also, for materials which have been contributed by libraries, we try to preserve direct links back to the library catalog. So for example, for the Harvard Yenjing materials, it's possible to directly click on a link and to open the same catalog entry for the particular copy of this particular edition of this particular text, which was scanned to produce the images that we're showing here. So this allows us to kind of, to some extent, offload a lot of metadata concerns, which are much more naturally handled in the library to librarians who are specialists in this. So if people want to find the original metadata or the, the up-to-date metadata for one of these texts, we basically point them to the library to show exactly where to find it. And the system has a lot of other functionality that's sort of secondary to this. Um, built on top of these representations, we have other, other features uh, to provide a reading environment, particularly for the classical Chinese materials. So we have things like uh, dictionary links. This is actually an interactive visualization if you view it on the site. Um, you can move over any particular part of the uh, Chinese text and it'll give you dictionary information. It's also aligned with an English translation. Um, we have things like parallel passage information, which is also layered on top of this, uh, and references to historical commentaries for this particular paragraph of text. So I'm not going to go into this in, in too much detail, but we also have these kinds of functionality. So this is now a fairly large project. It's been online in something like its present form since 2005, although it's evolved significantly since then. Um, we have around 25 to 30,000 users every day, so a lot of people make use of this system. 
Uh, and in total, we have around 5 billion characters in 30,000 texts, 25 million pages of primary source historical scanned uh, materials are in the system. And we have over 10,000 registered users who collectively contribute to the database in very concrete ways, which I'm going to get, get to in a moment. Um, we get something like 100, uh, something on the order of 100 contributions every day to this project through crowdsourcing. And it's also important to have some idea of where our users come from. The vast majority, as you might expect, come from Greater China. So over 50% from China and over 80% from China, Taiwan and Hong Kong taken together. Uh, but we do also have significant numbers of users in the US and Europe. And the entire project has, two, has several different interfaces for uh, different languages. So basically all of our um, <coughs> introductory and explanatory material and all of the user interfaces available in Chinese as well as English, simplified as well as traditional characters. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about OCR because it uh, takes quite a while to get into some of the details of this, which are quite complex. Uh, basically, the way that we get adequate OCR for these historical materials is by adapting to the specific domain, adapting to the types of images that we're expecting to deal with here. Uh, one of the first things that we do is training data assembly. So we have automated methods of extracting training data for Chinese, which consists of labeled character images for all of the characters that we want to recognize. This is particularly tricky for Chinese because there are so many characters and it's not practical to, to create this data manually as it would be for many other languages. Um, character segmentation, there are various things that we can do to improve character segmentation accuracy on these particular types of texts. Uh, and language modeling, which is a fairly standard kind of technique in OCR to basically take advantage of some contextual information in the ways that human readers would naturally do uh, subconsciously when they read these texts. But I'm, not going to, I'm happy to answer questions about these, but I'm not going to go into any detail of that. Other than to say, um, whenever I talk about OCR, people always ask me about accuracy. And I don't want to just give a number because I don't think it's meaningful to just give a number without any sort of context and without any sort of comparison. So here I'm going to give a very, very short comparison on one particular page image. So here we have a page image from Google Books at the top and Google Books current transcription of that page at the bottom. And I've highlighted in red all of the uh, inaccuracies here. So on the top I've highlighted the things which have not been transcribed and on the bottom are things which have been mistranscribed. So the error rate in this transcription is the combination of all the red marks on these two pages. If you put this into other OCR systems, you will get a corresponding result. This is Abby Fine Reader's result. This is Tesseract's result. Uh, you can see both of them are clearly better than Google Books. And this is the CTEX procedure result for the same page. So again, we don't get a perfect result, but we've significantly reduced the error rate. Uh, and on this particular example, which is fairly representative, the, the uh, accuracy goes from something like 40% in Google Books to something like 70% for off-the-shelf OCR and 94% for CTEX. So that's a significant reduction if you look at this in terms of error rate because the error rate for Google Books here is 60% and the error rate for CTEX is 6%. So that's a tenfold reduction in OCR errors. Um, of course, 94% is not 100%, so there are clearly errors in our uh, OCR output. And this is where the crowdsourcing comes in in the CTEX project. So we have this side-by-side -side view, which is how many scholars interact with our data because they want to refer directly to the primary source materials. Um, the idea is that users, when they identify mistakes, like this one highlighted in red here, uh, can click a button and immediately a simple textual representation of the content on this particular page is shown to them. So it's worth mentioning that this is not the underlying representation of the data. This is a transformation of the underlying representation of the data that's easy for users to edit. Uh, so they can just directly modify this in their web browser. And when they submit it, this is immediately stored and committed to the database. Uh, it's also important to mention that we're very open about who contributors are. This is basically the Wikipedia model where anyone can create an account and anyone can modify our data. So of course we have other ideas that are borrowed from or modeled on Wikipedia like an edit log. All of this is of course versioned. Um, every editing operation that's made is recorded in the edit log and we have a link to a diff style visualization showing what was changed. In this example a one was deleted and a three was inserted. And uh, we can also link this directly to the side-by-side -side representation, which makes it very easy to uh, determine, for anyone to determine, whether the actions of another editor are actually genuinely helpful edits or whether this is 
a mistake that should be reverted. So this is, this is quite easy to police because of this direct link back to the primary source data. And behind this, there is a serialization of the data uh, which our users are editing. It is also possible for users to edit this directly, but usually the easiest way is through our visual editing interface that I just showed you. Uh, but the representation itself is basically in terms of XML fragments which serialize chunks of text into a form that contains all of the data that we have about that particular unit of text, including, most importantly for in this context, the links to the specific locations on each of the scanned pages. Um, we also use the same idea or the same approach of visual editing tools to allow contributors to contribute more complex types of data. And this is one way in which we deal with the problem of characters which don't exist in Unicode, which frequently occur in um, this type of corpus. So the way this is handled in a visual editing tool is by users literally drawing on the uh, image data the region corresponding to the character of which they have no way of inputting, of which doesn't exist in Unicode. And this uh, gives them a rare character or variant character input uh, box, which asks them to provide certain metadata about this particular character instance, specifically things like composition and uh, radical stroke, number of strokes and so on. Uh, the system then uses the, their submission to do two things. The first of these is to look whether anyone else has input the same character in any other location. And they're then presented with a list of possible candidates. Uh, this actually also uses OCR to see whether the region they've selected actually corresponds to a character that we already have. And the idea is that then if it does, the user selects it and this allows us to link it automatically to the other instances of the same character. So this isn't simply saying we're going to use images instead of characters, this is saying we're using images, but behind them a more complex representation which links the same uh, images, i.e. images of the same abstract character, together. And the result of this is then an XML representation which can be pasted directly into the um, editing window. So our users don't actually have to understand XML, they're not expected to understand XML, but what they're editing is fundamentally XML. Um, so once this is submitted, this basically creates a character uh, and this can then be used to, to represent that character throughout the site. And this also makes it possible to have full text search, including characters which can't be input in Unicode. Uh, it also makes it possible to aggregate data about rare and variant characters uh, because we have the standard representation and the individual instances are linked. So this all happens transparently when users uh, input characters using this method. And the same approach can be used for inputting illustrations, which occur uh, as a percentage very infrequently in our data, but because we have so much data, uh, significant numbers of them do occur overall. Uh, we use a similar interface to allow users to actually mark up regions of particular pages, which correspond to uh, illustrations, uh, and provide some very simple annotations, for example, whether there is a caption for this particular image in this particular context, and again, what is the result of this is an XML representation of all of the information that the user submitted. And so this can then be used by the system to visualize uh, and represent these illustrations in the textual view of uh, the same text. So the image data, of course, is not necessary if you're dealing directly with the page images, but many ctext users prefer to deal with the textual representation of these texts once they've been transcribed and only refer to the images when they actually want to check or cite something. Uh, once we have this data, of course, there are other things we can do with it. We can implement image search uh, based on the captions, and we can also use this in the future to improve the accuracy of OCR and potentially to identify uh, illustrations automatically within our data because we now have significant amount of training data of specific examples on specific pages at specific locations. So I'm going to move on to another topic now, which is replication and failover. So one of the issues we have here is that we have a very distributed user base. Uh, we have many users in East Asia, but also in the US and Europe. Many of the international links on the internet between these locations um, perform suboptimally at various times of the day. There's significant latency just because of the distance, but at particular high uh, peak traffic times, the connectivity between these locations is not very good. And this is a very bad thing for us because we're relying on our users to actually contribute information, to participate, not just to be passive consumers of this content. So we want them to have as good a user experience as possible. And one of the ways that we 
make this possible is by having the entire system replicated in two completely different locations at the moment, one in the US and one in East Asia. And both of these have complete up-to-date copies of all of the information in the site. So it's possible if you connect from uh, London, for example, you will normally be connected to the US data center and all of your edits will be committed there. Whereas if you connected from China, you would connect to a data center in Hong Kong. Um, of course, this is where the crowdsourcing element is something which also has to be considered because our data changes continually. So we have instantaneous replication between these two sites. If you make an edit to the US data center, this will be transmitted to and committed to the East Asian one and vice versa. So uh, this is quite separate from the question of long-term backup, which is also something we do. We also have RAID volumes and multiple copies of all of our uh, data offline but we also have an instantaneous copy made online in a, in a different location. Uh, and this contributes to the project or the website having a very uh, relatively, uh, I would say very fast um, experience for our users regardless of where they're connecting from. Um, this also allows us to do something else which is very helpful which is to uh, automatically cope with any types of technical issues that cause problems at either of these data centers. If we have continuous monitoring of both of these sites in real time, and if one of them, for example, the North American data center, due to any kind of external factor, it could be a power, power failure, network failure, hardware failure, a software issue, uh, stops responding in the correct way, we can automatically fail over to have all of our users connected to the Asia Pacific data center and vice versa. So this is very convenient when things go wrong because things of course do go wrong. This happens transparently and doesn't require any intervention on our part to uh, happen. So the last of the things I'm going to introduce is how we actually make this data available to other people. Uh, and this is primarily done through an application programming interface designed for this project. And the motivation behind this is partly that this is the largest database of this type of material for pre-modern Chinese, but also it's not a fixed target. It is literally changing every day, every hour of every day, edits are made and things change. Uh, and most people typically are interested in some subset of this data which is relevant to them, but they always want to have access to the most accurate version of this data. And one particular use case of that is the case where somebody is transcribing a copy of a text because they actually want to have access to a high quality uh, transcription of it. This site provides an interface through which they can do that. If we have an API which allows them to export the latest copy of the data, then they actually have a ready-built workflow which they can use to transcribe a text and obtain the copy of it when they've completed. Uh, the other motivation behind the API is that there are different use cases and different requirements for dealing with this material. Uh, people may want to deal with the data in different types of structured forms, and people may want to connect this system to other external systems in different ways. So the API as it looks at the moment consists of three major components. One of them is uh, what we're calling CTP URN, so universal resource names, which specify some particular textual object within ctext. So these are uh, machine readable identifiers that refer to either one particular edition of a text or one particular chapter of one particular edition of the text. Uh, the other main components are a JSON API, which provides a mechanism for extracting machine-readable data and metadata from ctext, and slightly more unusually, a plugin system which is designed to allow our users to create specifications which ctext can understand of how to connect ctext to other external projects. Uh, and the idea here is that these are completely open and freely definable. Anyone can log into ctext and create these, and if they create a plugin for their own project or for some existing project, they can share this with other users, and there's a mechanism for them updating this in the future when the link structure of external sites changes. Uh, so what these look like in practice is something like this. This is a page from the ctext dictionary. Uh, system, so the users looked up a particular Chinese character here, and there's various information from CTEX, but the highlighted red section here corresponds to the plugins which this particular user has installed at this point in time. And each of these links to the corresponding page, the corresponding entry in a particular external dictionary. So there's a level of customization or personalization built into this in that users choose which plugins they want to use. They can create their own, but they can also choose to install ones which other users have created. And this helps to get around issues where some um, dictionaries, for example, may be subscription-based. Some institutions may have them, others may not. 
if you have access to this and it's important in the context of your research, you'll probably want the plugin, but the plugin doesn't apply to everyone because not everyone has access to this resource. Uh, the second main type of plugin at the moment are textual plugins. So these basically do the same kind of thing with textual material by sending a textual reference to an external resource with the expectation that the external resource will then use the JSON API to fetch textual data or metadata about that resource and do something with it. And of course, what it does is specific to the external resource. Uh, the very simplest type of this is the plain text plugin for Ctext, which is really an external application, which means that you can download it and modify it if you don't like the format that we ex export things in. Um, this simply fetches the data and provides a download link or allows you to copy and paste the data for a textual object in Ctext. Uh, but external resources can do much more complex things. Uh, and a really nice example of this is the Marcus project for uh, marking up and identifying using semi-automatic methods proper names, place names, uh, references to time periods in historical Chinese texts. So there's a plugin for Marcus, and Marcus supports the Ctext API, so it's possible to directly read any Ctext textual object into the Marcus interface um, and to immediately start performing these operations there. Uh, another example is the Text Tools plugin, which performs very simple types of textual analysis on Chinese texts. Uh, for example, regular expression, search, aggregation, uh, and this, the nice thing about this is that it can make use of the structure of these texts, which is also exported through the API in a consistent way. Uh, it also provides things like automated identification of text reuse within arbitrarily selected texts from the system, uh, as well as visualization of this data, in this case, as a network graph. Uh, so the very last thing I want to talk about is also related to the API, and this is use of CTEX data in digital humanities research and teaching. And the motivation here is that what this system provides via the API is a very simple and consistent method of importing data into an external tool or program. And the key, key thing here is that the data is always delivered in the consistent format specified by the API. And it, particularly for teaching use, in addition to the API itself, which is entirely specified through HTTP protocols, we also have a Python module which explains how to interact with this API. And the goal of the Python module is to add an additional layer of ab abstraction, which is particularly useful in the context of uh, the teaching we're doing at Harvard, which is digital humanities practical methods in Python for students uh, with a background in uh, Chinese studies. And the reason that this API is very useful for this is that it can greatly reduce the amount of time required for data wrangling in a teaching context, uh, and also avoid needing to work with pre-chosen example materials, because any materials accessible through the API are available in the same uh, consistent format. And also, again, in a teaching context, uh, although nice to have generally, is that this tends to lead to simpler programs which have easier logic to follow. And a really simple example of that is this very, very simple program here, which if you're all familiar with Python, uh, should be fairly clear what's going on here. The first line just says we're going to use the Ctex module. The second line fetches an entire textual object in a particular format. And, and then the remainder of the program performs a simple uh, regular expression search against this text. So the key thing here is that the URN identifies a textual object, so it's pretty obvious to anyone who's understood uh, what I've said so far and what URNs are in this context, how you would perform exactly the same function on a different textual object. You simply replace the URN. Uh, replace it with something else, you get the expected result. And the function here, and this is really what the Python module contributes to the process, specifies the type of structure. So in this case, we're getting the textual object as a string, but we didn't have to get it as a string. We could have got it as something more complex, uh, as you would be able to see in this program, except that it's going to be far too small and it's far too complex a program to read through. Uh, but the things I want to highlight in this program are mainly in the first line, which is we start out by specifying a list of, in this, in this case, four textual objects, again specified using URNs, and then later in the program, the, the data and metadata for those texts are extracted using the URNs and the API. And what this program actually does is to perform a principal component analysis um, visualization of certain features of this text uh, used for authorship uh, attribution or stylometry in this particular case using the data obtained from the API for these particular textual objects. And you can see in this 
uh, visualization here, the data has all come from the API, the metadata has also come from the API, and the structural information about the text has also come from the API, because each dot on this graph represents one chapter of one textual object. The colors represent the distinctions between the four textual objects. So the key thing here is that this relatively complex looking program is actually trivial to use and trivial to modify to perform exactly the same analysis on other materials because simply by changing the URNs, the rest of the logic in no way uh, depends upon the specific content of these texts. So it's very easy and intuitive for even for novice users who've never seen a Python program before to see how you would change this, how you would experiment, and how you would play around with this kind of technique. So the API makes quite sophisticated programs like this uh, very easy to write in a way that's general and not specific to particular data or data set. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to stop there to allow time for questions. Um, all of this is available and documented online, and I should say for those of you who are not working in Chinese primarily, uh, we do have a dual English and Chinese interface, and all of the explanations are available in both English and Chinese. So if you're interested, please take a look. Thank you. Thanks very much for those questions. So, okay, so the first question, the history, is basically this started as a very small project. This began, started out really, really small with, as a system for navigating one very specific historical text that I was interested in, um, and gradually grew from there. So the, the design was initially fairly general, but conceived of as a, an entirely static database system for working with textual materials. But textual materials which had particular type of format that made them map very closely to a database structure. So um, the, the text in question was actually the most canons, if any of you are familiar with that. It's a text which has a really strange writing style. It's almost written like an encyclopedia with very short entries. So it maps sort of naturally onto a database structure. And it's the kind of thing where you're likely to want to search for particular entries. It's also a text which has terrible textual issues um, and is very, very difficult to interpret. And these kind of things sort of informed the original design of, of CTEXT back in 2005. So it's grown organically since then until about 2012. Um, and throughout that period of time, it was basically essentially the same system gradually with additional functionality, additional content added to it, but primarily a static database. So the only sort of fundamental change in the design was really in 2012, where we moved to this wiki model where things are serialized in XML so that users can actually edit them directly. Prior to that, it was effectively using standoff markup, but in a custom designed uh, format, not XML. Um, so your question about the plugins, actually the, the plugins at the moment for dictionaries are much simpler than they might at first look. So, so they don't actually do anything particularly complex. All they do at the moment is to send the reference to the particular character or word that's been looked up to an external system. So in fact, each of those plugins consists of a very, very short XML file of maybe six or seven lines, which basically specifies um, some trivial metadata about the external system, you know, what it's called, how to refer to it. And the key thing it contains is a um, URL containing a component which can be replaced with the data that you want to send to the external site. So in the case of dictionaries, the dictionaries that we support are all dictionaries which support searching within that dictionary for a particular term. And effectively, all this mechanism does is provides a way of specifying a URL template which you can add certain things into in certain places to create a transformed U URL to a specific location in the external dictionaries. So at the moment, our integration with external dictionaries is fairly superficial, but in the future, we would uh, like to be able to have a mechanism to actually include external dictionary data within the CText interface as well, and that's something we're working on at the moment. Which 
if you take the next call. Okay.